overview of um, the chap of the third exam. So it begins with some initial rate um, data that's being used to uh, calculate the corresponding rate law expressions or looking at features like the rate constants. For the first one, um, we end up with orders of two and one. If we then take those and use any of the experiments, we can solve for the rate constant. And um, we want to make sure that there's also the correct units shown for that. The second one, the experimental data doesn't set up as clean within that. We don't have a way to isolate as cleanly what the order would be for reactants A and B, but we can still get to it and find that it's first order for both. This is one that at least in class we didn't practice, so I considered it sort of a, a stretch question. Um, and so key thing was to figure out that it was first order for both of the reactants. Uh, looking at sketches here of concentration versus time, here's some shown work for the first one, the kinds of feature I'm looking for. If we look at the details, well, it, it says that it's reaching equilibrium. It begins with equal concentrations of A and B, and the K value is less than 1. So based on the stoichiometry, I see B changing twice as fast as A. B and C are changing in a similar pattern. K is less than 1, so I end up um, favoring the reactants relative to the, the product. Within the second one here, we have A going to B quickly, so I have A diminishing. B increasing, it's an intermediate that then will itself diminish and C will rise in from there. These were the uh, kinds of features that I was looking for. The one involving a uh, first order reaction with the stated half-life, I thought this was very interesting. The way I would have solved it is shown the uh, same as its student. I would use the information to um, come up with what the rate constant is and then use that in the integrated rate law expression. In a really interesting way, I, I was really struck by a lot of folks solving by determining how many, uh, many half-lives were involved and just using the half-life expression. Uh, wasn't something I uh, had considered, but I thought it was clever. Within this one, integrated rate law um, expressions are applicable. If we know a particular integrated rate law, only one variable remains. We can graphically look to see at a given point uh, how much time has evolved and how much uh, the concentration is relative to the initial concentration. And I was also looking for, given the order of the reaction, were the units correct? Looking at the plausibility of a reaction mechanism, I was definitely looking for how experimental data re leads to a rate law expression. And the proposed mechanism must be consistent with that uh, rate law expression. It also needs to lead to the correct, correct reaction stoichiometry. There's additional features uh, that some folks talked about, thinking about, well, in terms of the molecularity, were one step's more or less plausible than others, maybe measuring an intermediate. Also, some interesting suggestions of how uh, the temperature could be something that one would consider. But I was definitely looking for those first two. And the uh, more than just saying experimental data, experimental data leading to the rate law expression. Uh, within this one, we have a mechanism that's being proposed, uh, different questions, and considering what would be a rate law expression consistent with this. Folks did well on this one. I like this part where it was breaking down what could be considered a catalyst and intermediate reactants and products. Uh, as far as then the rate law expression, we could have a description for the slow step and then attempt, an attempt to remove a listed intermediate. I like that uh, feature there. I would say it would also be um, possible to view the H2O as being in excess with a constant con constant concentration if you wanted to um, include that within the uh, expression. Main thing I was looking for within this, this portion was identification of the slow step and then seeing what did it mean to remove and restate that intermediate in different terms. Uh, this particular one, uh, this question, it worked great. Students were successful in many different ways. There were a lot of different features that you could describe, and I thought uh, outstanding work on it. 
within this one, this is also a question that has many different ideas. So let's think about this one. We have an initial equilibrium. If we're at equilibrium, that means the overall rate forward equals the overall rate reverse. A given rate forward is going to include the rate constant and the concentration terms. For the final equilibrium, we're again having the overall rate forward equal the overall rate reverse. So if we were to look at a few of these different features, the rate constants themselves, the only thing that changes that is the temperature. So in all the other cases, no change. The large K value, well, that's a ratio of the small Ks. So if the rate constants themselves are not changing, the equilibrium constant is not changing. Adding an inert gas with our description, uh, according to Le Chatelier, no change in um, our setup there either. It's not going to be involved with the um, uh, affecting the K. It's not affecting the rates. Adding more uh, particles to our container that are involved in the reaction, well, that will be increasing the rates both forward and reverse when we reach equilibrium compared to the initial equilibrium. That's the comparison we're making. If we're removing particles, the overall rates both forward and reverse will have decreased. When it comes to the temperature, well, it's exothermic. So Le Chatelier tells us that if we increase the temperature, the K goes down. If we're thinking about the manner of the collisions, increasing the temperature will increase the rate constants. Both of them increase. They don't increase symmetrically, however. That's why the overall K ratio changes. But we're having um, the increase leading to both the rate forward and rate reverse both increasing. But again, it's not symmetric, and that's what shifts the equilibrium. Looking at the role of collisions, I think Atkins does a really nice job with this. And the most complete answers were one that explained the features that were in the Arrhenius equation, because the Arrhenius equation is all about, tell me about the nature of the collisions. Within this one, folks, again, did a really nice job. For the first one, the best answers were ones that discussed the role of concentration or the lack thereof when we had a pseudo zero order process and what was taking place between the reactant and the substrate. Regarding the ozone layer, the best answers here gave a description of a catalyst and its regeneration within um, the uh, reaction process. This one we had uh, drawing Lewis structures and then interpreting them. Uh, I looked at this cohesively. I was looking at a lot of different features. I wanted to see the Lewis structures and the corresponding VSEPR analysis, your description of the conditions that would give rise to absorbing microwaves or the infrared, and then how that applied back with the um, your own assignments here. If there was one that I saw that some folks struggled with was this very first Lewis structure uh, and not recognizing that that was a polar molecule uh, with a vent structure, just like you'd also find within H2O. This particular prompt, um, I thought there were very thoughtful responses, very well done. Um, it made me think I need to include this concept in Chemistry 1910. There's an opportunity to include it there, and the fact that there were a lot of gaps in your prior knowledge that we were able to address, I really think this is, should be included in general chemistry for everybody. So I'm going to, uh, in the future, include it within my 1910 course. Really nice job on this one. This last one right here, a lot of different um, uh, questions. This was collecting descriptive chemistry over a couple days of class. For full credit within this entire set, uh, you, you could make it two, three mistakes. That was fine. I still felt big picture. Um, you had a good understanding. And half credit was around seven or eight mistakes, and I just sort of prorated from there. So to step through some of these, uh, comparing the bonds between sodium bromide, aluminum bro bromide, this is a case where the aluminum is a very polarizing cation, shifts electron density, and we've seen how that gives it aspects of covalency within its bond. Uh, hydride anion being quite large, got that. Next one, when we're thinking about filling the um, 
molecular orbitals for our alkaline earth? Well, the melting points greater than for our alkalis. We're not feeling um, antibonding. We're again, we're seeing a merging of the uh, the atomic orbitals that are contributing to the uh, bonding molecular orbitals. So it's incorrect to say that we're feeling antibonding at that case. Carbon can go beyond uh, coordination number four. Silicon and uh, carbon, the nature of their structures in double bonds or uh, being more prevalent in the carbon than within the silicon. That's a true statement. If we're looking at the emission spectrum, I agree that the emission spectrum of hydrogen involves electronic transitions, but it's not of the molecules themselves. It's of the hydrogen atoms themselves. If it was a molecule, then you've got greater complexity for what's going on because you don't have a pure electronic uh, spectrum that results. You'd have aspects of vibrations and other things that would take place. When it comes to sodium, we see that sodium has a really distinct yellowish color to it. It's not white. Um, if we look at the density of aluminum, this is getting at the idea that the density of the particle is not the same as the density of the collection of the particles. Uh, flame test is not a periodic trend. The abundance of elements in the universe, main two are hydrogen and helium. That's not true the uh, Earth's crust. We saw an example of a phase diagram for another substance besides H2O having this uh, description. Measurement of density of nitrogen, that's how um, folks went on to discover argon. The uh, chemical producing the greatest quantity, sulfuric acid, which is then used um, in fertilized, fertilizer production, get uh, your uh, phosphorus. Liquid nitrogen, liquid helium, very important industrial refrigerants for us. Uh, if I'm thinking of polarizable anions, a large size is the key. I gave credit for uh, ha including that feature because I think uh, I wasn't loving the question. You could argue in terms of aspects of the negative charge either way. So I, I was mainly looking for the size on that. Um, when we're thinking about our reaction of NH3 and BF3, the ammonia is acting as a base. The BF3 is acting as the acid, the uh, boron atom there. If we're thinking about uh, beryllium and uh, aluminum having similar properties, it's their charge to size ratio. That was our diagonal relationship. Uh, the next question, molecules with 4, 8, 12, or 60 atoms, uh, that question didn't work very well. I was trying to get at how phosphorus is a P4 molecule. We have S8, boron 12, and carbon 60. Uh, I ended up dropping that one. That question wasn't functioning very well. The next one, I was trying to get at how boron and uh, nitrogen are isoelectronic with carbon and form similar structures. But I also see some folks looking at this independently and saying, well, silicon and carbon form similar structures. So uh, I, I, I was uh, saying that that was understandable as well. Um, for the next one, not associated with the discovery of oxygen, that's uh, our Ramsey. Uh, the A, B, and C all are. The two that we absolutely would associate with the discovery of oxygen, those that get credit, would be A and B, Lavoisier and Priestley. An element known since ancient times and found in nature is in, in its elemental form, that sulfur. Uh, aluminum, certainly um, prevalent, but it wasn't isolated as a compound until we were able to use a, a electrochemical method. Same thing with sodium. Helium, recent discovery uh, based on its spectrum by looking at the sun.